cultures. I often see that yes, modernity for people like us, the urban, metropolitan, middle class, often makes us believe that I live in the world of freedom. I have a credit card, I can go to any mall, buy any kind of commodity, among hundreds varieties of mobile, I can choose any of them. Among hundred varieties of medical insurance, I can buy any of them. Among hundreds of private super specialty hospitals, I can choose any of them. I can buy any commodity I like. I can cast my vote after five years. Now, apparently, I enjoy freedom. I have a sense of freedom. And modernity gives me that sense of freedom. But then, deep down, there is a question that begins to haunt me. And herein lies my third confession. Is it actually my freedom that I am enjoying? Or is it that my freedom, what I regard as my freedom, is not actually true freedom? It is some kind of an indulgence. It is becoming some kind of indulgence. Is it that, in the name of freedom, I am becoming increasingly dependent on the externalities of human existence? Is it because, in the name of freedom, I am becoming dependent on the entire mythology that the market sells, that the market propagates? Is it because that, in the name of freedom, I am becoming increasingly dependent on the medical legal industry? Or is it possible for me to have a sense of freedom, freedom not in the externalities, but freedom that emerges from a deep notion of the self and the joy of being and the joy of the self, not in the marketplace, not in the externalities of human existence? So that's another question and another confession that begin to haunt me. And the fourth one, which I believe is very crucial and related to the three, I also live in a world in which death is often being seen as certain kind of something which is ugly. Death is a taboo. And that entire notion of modernity and the modern existence is afraid of death, afraid of facing death. It's mega hospitals, it's ventilator machines, it's highly sophisticated medical gadgets, it medical insurance corporations, all are asserting and all are proclaiming that death is something that can be postponed. And death is something that is ugly. And death does not go ahead with that modernist notion of linearity of progress. It doesn't wish to stop. It doesn't have a sense of resignation and withdrawal. But we all die. So should we die as something with a realization that death is something ugly that we are trying to postpone? Or is it possible to have a new meaning of death? Death as redemption. A very meaningful death, a very magical death, and a very poetic death. Is it possible to have another meaning to death? Now that's the fourth confession. So my troubled soul is striving for these answers that can work, be renunciation, can resistance be an act of prayer, can freedom be an inner call of the soul, and can death become magical and poetic? And with these four questions and four confessions, I begin to look at history. And when I begin to look at history, my ways of looking at history once again become qualitatively different from the way the professional historians in the university setting look at history. I do not bother myself about that such a sophisticated, finer debate in historiography between the nationalist historiography, the Marxist, and the subalternist, the colonialist, or the post-colonialist historiography. Instead, I begin to look at history in order to see that whether in history I find some living figure with flesh and blood who could open the window and who could respond to some of my own existential dilemma and who could respond to some of my confessions. And those four questions that emerged out of these confessions on work and contemplation, on resistance and prayer, and on war, freedom and indulgence, and on death and meaning. And then my engagement with Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi begins to become. 
So from the politics of debunking to the confessions of a troubled soul, then eventually my engagement with Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi begins to become. And when I speak of an engagement, as I have said, I am not a Gandhian. When I begin to engage, talk about that creative engagement, what I mean is that creative engagement is almost like opening up the window. And an engagement with Gandhi is that Gandhi was somewhat opening the window and then it is up to me what horizon I see and how I see, define and experience the world. And in my seeing and experiencing the world, it is quite possible that I need not always agree and I did not, my ways of seeing the world did not always converge with that of Gandhi. That is immaterial. But what is important is that a creative engagement means, and by looking at history, that here is a figure who is not mythological, who lived in time, who had an embodied existence, and who had his own pleasure and the pain, weakness and the strength and the vulnerability, and a man like us, and who became from a very timid, shy Mohandas to a charismatic Mahatma Gandhi. So in his life, in his epic life and politics, can he open the window for me? And I believe that when that engagement begins to become, I see that one by one, Gandhi opened those four windows. And through this opening of these four windows, my four confessions begin to make a sense and certain kind of a meeting of Gandhi's confessions and my confessions begin to take place. So Gandhi opened the first window. And when Gandhi opened the first window, I, through that window, I once again went back to history. And as it was said, that as it was described in his experiments with truth, that from Dublin, I bought a first class ticket and took the train. And when the train arrived the capital of the Natal province, then at the Natal province, that capital of the Natal province, then the beddings would be provided to the passengers. A railway staff arrived at the coach and he asked me, do I need a piece of bedding? And I said, no, I already carry one. He left. After some time, a white person came and he looked at me, gave a very penetrating look up and down, observed me thoroughly, and he left. And after that, he accompanied two other white people. And they all asked me that, please go to the van compartment. And I told them that I have a first class ticket. And they said, that doesn't matter. You are colored and you cannot afford to have travel in the first class coach, please go to the van compartment. And I refused. And then a constable came and they threw me out of the train and they pushed me. It was cold winter, it was night, it was severely cold. I was shivering, but that a question began to haunt my mind that should I leave South Africa and go back to my own country bearing that insult? Or should I think that all that which has happened to me, this insult, is just a superficial symptom of a deeper crisis, the crisis of color prejudice and the exploitation? Should I stay back in South Africa till I begin to fight this fatal disease of color prejudice? And that night, shivering cold in South Africa, wounded, humiliated, injured, Mohandas began to ask himself this question. And then we all know, at that moment of injury, and the question that Gandhi asking himself, and that question would eventually help us to look at when Gandhi wrote his commentary on the Bhagavad Gita and looked at the Bhagavad Gita and tried to see that how Arjuna became certain kind of an archetype of existential human existential dilemma. Should I take part in this world or should I escape the world? And it was this question that was haunting Arjuna. And Krishna as a friend, guide, counselor, was trying to engage in Arjuna. Now Gandhi often in his life, 
in his politics invoked the Bhagavad Gita and the Urjuna's dilemma. And a similar dilemma that he witnessed in that night in South Africa when Gandhi was pushed from the train and thrown out of the train. And a life of work and the intense activity began. And in that life of intense activity and work, one could always see and notice that there is certain kind of a poise, there is certain kind of calmness, and there is certain kind of tranquility. Autobiography, my experiments with truth. When one reads that introduction of the experiments with truth, there is one thing that just surprises one and that amazes one. And Gandhi said that when I write, and we all know that writing autobiography in a way is also about writing about oneself. Writing autobiography can might be a very egoistic enterprise. I begin to believe that I matter. All that I do, I matter. I am a great actor of history, and my history, my story should be known to the people. In the act of writing autobiography, there could be an inflated ego. Gandhi was deeply conscious of this fact, and in that autobiography, Gandhi would come to that point, and Gandhi would say, these are the experiments with the science of Shottagra. And if at any time the reader feels that through my experiments I have begun to talk about myself, then it is my tragedy, it is my fault, because my entire effort is only to talk about the experiment, and in that entire effort, my task is that I wish to reduce myself into zero, into emptiness. So this urge to reduce oneself into zero in the context of immense activities and the amidst of intense activities, that Gandhi slowly began to open the window. And I began to feel that it is here that in Gandhi's life, in Gandhi's dilemmas, in Gandhi's own vulnerability, one could possibly see certain kind of a merger between my question and Gandhi's question, between my confession and Gandhi's confession, that is it possible now to have a sense of work with a sense of contemplation, with a sense of poise, whether work itself can be an act of renunciation. So with Gandhi's eyes, one begin to look at the Bhagavad Gita once again and trying to derive the meaning of the work, the work the intense activity and work itself as certain kind of an offering, certain kind of a renunciation. Then Gandhi opened the second window, began to open the second window. And then I could see that here is a man who is registering and registering again and again, a man of protest, a man of resistance, right from the days of South Africa to the establishment of the Tolstoy farm to Gandhi coming back in India, meeting with Gopal Krishna Gokhale, making sense of the country, visiting the country, working with the indigo farmers of Champaran and the textile workers of Ahmedabad, to a series of movements from the non-cooperation to civil disobedience to the Quit India movement and to the partition riots, the movement towards Noakhali and then Delhi and Calcutta and the Gandhi's last few days, a man of resistance and a man of movement. But then, as Gandhi opened the second window, I saw that in that resistance, there was also a sense of prayer. There was also a sense of prayer, because Gandhi's resistance was somewhat resistance of a qualitatively different kind. And in that resistance, there was a sense of prayer. And out of that prayer, would emerge that notion of Shodhagra, would emerge that notion where Gandhi would invoke the Sermon on the Mount, and Gandhi would try to believe and try to argue. And as in one of his essays, Gandhi would say that, I am not against the Englishman. I am not against the European. What I am against, I am against the colonialism as a practice. And in my resistance, there is a deep longing and there is a deep prayer. And my resistance, if it is sufficiently moral, sufficiently ethical, sufficiently pure, then I do hope that it is possible for the colonizers to understand the meaning of the resistance 
and to emancipate themselves from the evils of colonialism. Now it is this resistance as certain kind of a prayer for collective redemption. And that would lead Gandhi to argue that it is not the mouse that forgives the cat. Forgiveness is the virtue of the courageous. So when I talk about non-violence, I do not equate non-violence with cowardice. Non-violence is the privilege of the brave, of those who have that ability to endure pain and suffering. So I take death as my pillow and I sleep on that pillow. Instead of killing others, I imagine my Shottagrohi to evolve the art of dying, to evolve the art of dying because in my act of resistance, emerges out of a sense of prayer for collective redemption of entire humankind. So in that act of resistance and the sense of prayer, I just, Gandhi, opened the second window and I began to find certain kind of a meaning and began to look at my second confession and the second question that I posed. And then Gandhi opened the third window. Is it my freedom? or is it intelligence? In my freedom, is it the freedom which is based on the externalities? Or is the freedom also the rhythm of the inner self, rhythm of the soul? 1909, you know, Gandhi's Hind Sharaj, and when one begins to look at the text, again one sees this third window opening, Gandhi opening the third window. And in Hind Swaraj text, Gandhi would say, and say simply, but with a great depth, and distinguish between the brute force and the soul force. Brute force is violent, aggressive, impulsive. Brute force is based on the seduction of the external, the temptation of the external. As opposed to the brute force, soul force emanates out of self-discipline, emanates out of a deep realization of the inner treasure within. And it is this awakening of the treasure within that would enable one, as Gandhi would imagine in Hind Sharaj, to strive for the real Sharaj, to strive for real freedom. If colonialism is centered on the principle of desire, it is the desire for the wealth, it is the desire for the new land, it is the desire for the colony, then decolonization would mean a paradigm shift, creating a new culture, creating a new polity based on a different notion of life. A life not centered on the brute force implicit in the colonial principle of aggression and desire, but a life centered on self-force and the awakening of the treasure within and the inner treasure. And it was at that juncture, as Gandhi beginning to open the third window, some pages of the Hind Sharaj, written in the form of a dialogue and conversation, begin to strike one's mind and imagination. And one of the famous passage in Hind Sharaj that Gandhi would write, that mind is a restless bird. The more it wants, the more restless it becomes. And this restlessness, this neurotic restlessness, leading to the desire, and that desire leading to the terrible aggression and the violence in our times. If Western civilization or the modern colonial civilization is satanic, is a disease, the roots of this disease have to be seen in the restlessness of the mind that is striving for that aggression and for that desire. And the decolonization would mean creating a paradigm shift. So I do not wish to replace the British rule by another set of rulers who follow the similar principle. So when I talk about decolonization and Sharaj, Gandhi would say that it would mean an altogether different paradigm shift, a radical paradigm shift from brute force to soul force. And that would take him to some of the beautiful metaphorical examples in Hind Sharaj. That I over it.